Ranking Member Grassley. I had the honor of serving Iowa in the Senate for four decades. Uh, I've been chairman of the Finance and Judiciary Committee, so I know what it is to be chairman of a committee, and uh, I'm honored to serve with you on this committee as uh, your chairman and I'm ranking member. I've seen plenty of problems facing our nation, and most were resolved through bipartisanship. And bipartisanship is going to be really, really necessary if we're ever going to crawl out of our deep fiscal hole that we're in right now. Every week since becoming ranking member, I've tried to focus the conversation on America's fiscal problems. We're facing public debt, then in a few years, we'll surpass record levels set in the wake of World War II. But five of our first six hearings this Congress have been about climate change. We've discussed sea level rise, hurricanes, wildfires, and the state of the insurance industry. Climate change is always worth discussing and must be discussed. It should be on everybody's agenda. But more immediate threat within this committee's jurisdiction needs to be addressed. The United States is barreling towards a fiscal crisis. We've been on an unsustainable fiscal path for decades, and, and that's under both Republican and Democrat. And bipartisan pandemic spending accelerated our journey to this fiscal cliff that we're facing. In times of national crisis, the federal government must be able to respond with the emergency spending. But once the crisis subsides, Congress must tighten its belt to put debt and deficit on a sustainable, manageable path. Unfortunately, the exact opposite approach was taken the past two years. Despite an economy well on its way to recovery, the Democrats who control the entire government, all three branches, or all three political branches, chose to go on a multi-trillion dollar bipartisan or partisan spending binge. Prominent economists from previous Democrat administrations sounded a warning alarm. We had Larry Summers and Jason Furman being the most prominent speaking out. They correctly warned that the Biden administration partisan spending spree would have consequences. Those consequences are now coming to a head. Decades high inflation is proving difficult to stamp out. Rapidly rising interest rates are taking a toll on our economy, almost visible on our financial system. Several banks have found themselves flat-footed holding on to older low interest government bonds that nobody wants uh, uh, to take in. Uh, the Fed finds itself behind the eight ball. Further rate hikes are probably necessary to tame inflation. But doing so will put more stress on our financial system and the broader economy. And yet President Biden and too many in Congress refuse to acknowledge that everyone knows to be true that our debt and deficits are unsustainable at unsustainable levels. We can no longer kick the can down the road. President Biden, I want to tell you for the good of the country, you must show presidential leadership. No more playing politics. A good first step would be to engage Speaker McCarthy in bipartisan talks to raise the debt limit and lay the groundwork for fiscal discipline moving forward. This committee should also be engaged. Let's have a serious and frank discussion about our dire fiscal situations. Let's hold bipartisan hearings with respected economists and policy experts from both sides of the aisle. Let's examine our finances and find solutions. So let me be clear. I support an all of the above approach to energy production. The majority of Iowa's energy comes from wind. I've been credited with creating the wind energy tax credit. We get 60% of our electricity today from wind and in a four, three or four days or three or four years, that'll be 80%. 
I re -sport, re, uh, support renewable technologies before uh, be becoming more and more competitive. I hope uh, 30 years ago when I got the wind energy uh, tax credit passed, I was uh, 10 or 15 years ahead of any discussion of uh, climate change at that time. So I don't think I have to take a back seat to anybody doing what we can to fight uh, global warming. Now we have oil and gas is clearly dominant in the United States energy sector. The reality is that fossil fuels account for 79% of U.S. energy consumption. It's naive to think that an energy transition will happen even in 10 years or that markets won't be able to keep up. Environmentalists blocking the permitting of new energy and mining projects will cause further delay. And for the United States to, uh, could, to uh, change to renewables is entirely proper. But when you think about how the third world nations are dependent upon uh, cheap energy, and if we want to help them get out of the poverty hole that they're in, we're doing an injustice to them if we believe in that. Besides, we seem to be backing up the use of child labor in the Congo when we get lithium out of the Congo for our uh, batteries, for our cars. So we need diversity to maintain energy security, and energy security is, of course, national security. Even President Biden understands that we're going to we're going to need fossil fuels well into the foreseeable future. So, Mr. Chairman, you've made your message on climate change loud and clear, but let's also focus on the immediate threats that square squarely within this committee's jurisdiction. I thank you very much for listening to me. Well, Ranking Member, I turn to you. Senator Grassley. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> quite regularly we preached uh, by corporate elitists that think that we ought to be carbon neutral by some arbitrary dates. And then we see the hypocrisy of how they fly around the world in their private jets, Mr. Dr. Zyker, and, and then they say they can pay for it because they have the wealth to buy carbon credits. And then they talk about how they want to save the planet and help the working class of America by paying lip service to environmental justice but no one ever addresses just how harmful their decarbonization dreams would be in practice. So to you, what impact would federally imposed divestment from fossil fuels have on the U.S. economy? Well, we have, we have several estimates in the literature on the cost of um, achieving net zero emissions in the U.S. and, and internationally. Uh, there's my estimate from a few years ago, the cost of the Green New Deal, which is just one variation of a net zero um, policy for the electricity sector alone, my estimate was about $500 billion per year permanently, or about $4,000 per U.S. household. Um, the American Action Forum, uh, Doug Holes Aiken uh, wrote a study. He used to be the, um, the head of the Congressional Budget Office. He used a somewhat different methodology and came up with numbers <clears throat> roughly equal to mine, about $500 billion per year. Let, let me take <coughs> it from those two figures you just gave us and uh, tell the impact that that would have on poor and working class American families. Well, if you look, um, if you look at um, the um, data on... Um, from the uh, Energy Information Administration about the cost of electricity from renewable sources, wind and sour, uh, solar power versus conventional energy. What you'll see is the cost of uh, wind plus gas turbine backup, which you need to, to avoid blackouts. It's about four times higher than the cost of natural gas generation. And the, then, to answer your question, the, the question then becomes, what does that do to household budgets? And uh, if you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, 
reports on uh, the percentage of household budgets spent on electric power by income quintile, you'll see that for the lowest income quintile, it's about 9%. For the next quintile, it's, I think, around 6%. And it's a slowly, it's a declining percentage of household budget as you move up the income ladder. So there's no question these policies are really highly regressive <clears throat> unless they are funded by taxpayers through the tax system, in which case we should double the cost amounts at a minimum because of the excess burden or dead weight loss, if you want to call it that, of the tax system. Um, Turner and Lastman did a study of the energy of net zero emissions, not only for the electricity sector, but for the whole economy, electric vehicles, building refits, et cetera. And their estimate is $50,000 a year per household permanently, every year. Uh, this, this is not cheap, and anyone who claims that uh, an energy transition will occur naturally because of a cost advantage on the part of unconventional energy is, I think, being deeply, deeply unrealistic. Okay, let me go to uh, Mr. Pirrisi. Um, you, uh, we all know you broad background in various departments of government on this whole issue. So, do you expect the world to forego energy security in an effort to reduce greenhouse gases? And will fossil fuel demand collapse? And are you concerned about fossil fuel assets being stranded? So absolutely not, uh, Senator Grassley. Uh, we've had a long-term project with the Institute of Energy Economics in Japan, traveled all through South Asia. And what you, when you meet the local political leaders and energy planners in those countries, they tell you they'd like to buy gas if it were cheaper. But if they can't get it, they're going to get coal. And so. Are, it's, it's so misguided. We, we can put a lot of gas on the water. We can produce a lot more natural gas in this country. And even at the upcoming G7 meetings, you're going to see some disagreement on the role of gas. And unfortunately, I think our, the current administration is sort of opposed to making a strong statement and to promote the use of gas as a form for energy security and cost effectiveness.